Ho, ho, ho. Hello, and welcome to a very special episode of the podcast, our first holiday season here at Just 7 Steps. It's been such a wonderful year so far, bringing you all the amazing content, and I don't want today to be any different. So I searched the internet for someone who could help us out today in bringing you some valuable hints and suggestions as you head into the holiday season with children who have disabilities or behavior challenges. This week on the Just 7 Steps podcast. Hi, my name is Robert Schramm, and I'm a board certified behavior analyst, education specialist, parenting consultant, and happy holiday dad of two young ladies, Zoe and Lainey. My girls turned 14 and 12 this year, and as we get ready for the holiday season, I thought it might be nice to get some guidance on how to make the holidays as peaceful, joyful, and fun for everyone as we can. To this end, I'm very excited to meet and to introduce to you Leanne Page. Leanne is a BCBA parenting coach, author of two best-selling parenting books, and a mom of two elementary-aged kids. She shares the science of behavior with all parents to help them save their sanity and really connect with their kids through online workshops and fun challenges at parentingwithaba.org. I'm going to save the rest for Leanne to tell herself as we get into the holiday spirit on the podcast. Ladies and gentlemen, join me in welcoming BCBA and parenting coach Leanne Page. Hi, Leanne. So nice of you to join us here today. Um, Hope you're doing well and excited about the upcoming holiday season. Yeah, thank you so much for having me. Yeah, well, I told my audience a bit about you and uh, why, uh, I tell you what, why don't we just start with Uh, a little bit about you and how and why you got into the field of ABA. Yeah, I was a special ed teacher almost 20 years ago, my first year teaching. Um, And I worked with kids with autism spectrum disorders. I had a master's degree in educational psychology, and I still had never heard of a BCBA. I did not know it was a thing. Um, And so the first school district I ever worked at here in Texas was amazing. And they brought in BCBAs to train us as special ed teachers. And this woman would come and give us trainings. And I thought, I want to be her. You know, that's a, be this woman. That's amazing. That's pretty much my, my history as well. I started out in the, in the, spe- in the education system, worked into special ed, yeah. uh, and then was working with kids who were not succeeding. Uh, and we called in a behavior analyst who basically introduced me to the principles of behavior and the rest, the rest was history because I, I, I couldn't get enough of it. Yeah. Uh, that's that's so awesome. Uh, so I, I want to thank you so much for coming and taking time with us today. Um, you know, I, I think uh, one of the things that that most intrigued me about you when we were first talking uh, was that you also, like me, are very um, focused on parent training yeah. uh, and that you want to have parents, you want to help parents to have the best skill set that they can to approach their daily challenges. Um, so I know you've written a couple of books. Uh, why don't you tell us a little bit about those books? Yeah, I, um, I shifted gears to make parenting with ABA. I did other things in the ABA field, you know, work traditional ABA centers and things. Um, when I became a mom and so when my oldest was a baby, I joined a mom's group and had these mentor moms who were so helpful, but then they would talk about how they punished their kids all the time. And, you know, I took everything away and they're still acting like this or that, or, you know, people would use spankings and things and talk about this. And I sat there as, you know, the new mom with an infant going, why are they talking about that? Like, why are they doing these things? Don't they know better? And then no, they don't know better. They don't have a degree in behavior. You know, we get trained in this stuff as behavior analysts and the people who need it are parents. Um, so I just started blogging, using my brain. I was a stay-at-home mom. I felt like my brain was turning to mush. And so I started blogging and I turned that into my first book, which is called Parenting with Science. Um, I call it the little book that could, because it's very small on purpose, because nobody has time to read a textbook if you're a busy mom or dad. Um, and it just gives you the intro to what is positive reinforcement? How can we be positive with our kids and build stuff up instead of this took everything away and I punished them and this and that, that I was hearing all the time. Yeah. It's, it's so interesting because I know that, uh, people have this idea that behavior analysts are all about, uh, consequences and punishment and, and, and it's really, it's really not like that at all. In fact, understanding the science of behavior allows us to avoid focusing on the negative and avoid, um, 
pushing families towards uh, the types of things that you see and hear all the time where fa families really are punishing uh, their kids and not in a way that just reduces behavior, but in a way that that affects the relationship negatively and, and things that we need to to really focus on. So so I'm glad uh, that you're out there doing this. And, and when, when did this all change? And when did this all start for you? When did you get into the, the parent coaching aspects? It's a good question. I should know the answer to <laughs> my first book came out in 2015. So about seven years ago, and it's just kind of evolved from there. Um, I have been a stay at home mom. I have two little kids. And so the business side of things just grew more availability to do coaching, to offer online courses and workshops and things has grown over the last seven years. Well, that's amazing. Um, so what would you say your mission is with parenting with ABA.org? Yeah, my mission is to save parent sanity by sharing simple behavior tools with them. Well, that's a pretty simple, uh, <laughs> that's a pretty simple thing quick, to say. To the point. <laughs> <laughs> it's quick, it's to the point. Uh, but I'm sure it's a lot more involved than yeah. just uh, uh, than 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 it sounds in, in that. Um, and and so you do consulting work as well as uh, do you do workshops for larger groups that sort of thing? Yep, I lo I love talking to parent groups and things, but I also teach behavior analysts how to better work with parents. So I teach continuing education on how to have compassionate parent training. That's awesome. It sounds like we're pretty similar in our yeah, career. both That's sides. Mm -hmm. So cool. Uh, so let's go ahead and get into the the topic uh, for today, the holidays. Uh, they can be such a, a source of joy and happiness, but for families of children with certain disabilities or behavior challenges, they can also be fraught with difficulties. So today on the podcast, I was hoping to share with the audience some tips and advice to help them have the most peaceful holiday season, uh, regardless of whatever challenges that they're facing. Uh, I know that you've presented on this on this topic in the past. Uh, so I guess what I'd like to know is, is what are your favorite, uh, or most valuable tips and ideas for families who may be a bit anxious heading into the holiday season? I think the very first thing is getting on the same page with your spouse or your partner. What of all these holiday events matter as a family? What matters to you? If your children are either old enough or able to communicate in a way where you can have this discussion with them, include them, otherwise do it without them, but actually sit down and say, here's a list of all the things we could do or all the things we're invited to. We have three things with cousins on this side of the family and two things with grandparents on this side and all, it's a lot of stuff on your calendar. And if you live in a um, urban setting, I live in Dallas and my daughter is coming home from school every day going, well, so-and-so went and saw the ice sculptures at this place. And this other kid told me about this event. And there's, you know, a million things we could do. Let's make a list and prioritize. And so with kids, I like to do just a thumbs up, thumbs up. It's great. I want to do it. Medium. I don't really know, man, or thumbs down. I don't care. You could do a Likert scale of one to 10. How important is this to you to figure out? We don't have to do all these things. And even if it's extended family invites, you don't have to do them all, but you do need to decide which ones matter. You do need to talk to your partner or your spouse and say, which of these things with your whole family matter to you? And then let's drop all the other ones and let's focus on what matters. So the first thing is, you know, open communication to whittle down all of these commitments and these things and these Christmas parties or going to see Santa at the mall or whatever it may be. Let's pick the ones that are most important. And if your kids are able to participate in this with you, it's really powerful because what most families I've worked with have found, the ones their kids like the most are the cheapest. <laughs> they are not the big, expensive, dramatic things. They're like drinking hot cocoa, wearing your pajamas in the car and looking at Christmas lights. You know, they're the free little fun cutesy traditional things and where the parents are sitting here going, well, we need to save all this money to go ride the train that doesn't actually go anywhere that goes to the North pole and all of these sorts of things. And having that open conversation is where we need to start. Yeah. And we, we need to make sure that they go you know, ice skating and we need to do all these things that, yeah. and, and quite often the problem is, is that you have such a strong desire as a parent to give your kids a magical experience that you overwhelm them with yeah. the number of things that you try to do. Um, and that's where the frustration can set in because maybe you're doing things that the kids really weren't all that interested in doing to begin with. Right. And I think you're you're giving great advice in that if you can just um, sit down and bring bring the spouses together on, on this conversation, of course, and try to figure out that between, 
between the, the, the family members themselves, including the kids, mm -hmm. what is what really is the priority here? And let's make sure that we're doing quality time over quantity time. Yeah. yeah. And it's parents often when I share that are like, oh, I don't want to ask the kids. They're going to ask to like, I don't know, fly on a plane and go on a vacation somewhere or something big. And almost every single time you're surprised at how simple and sweet their answers are, what they want. They want to watch a Christmas movie and stay up late. Mm -hmm. Okay. <laughs> That's free and takes maybe an hour extra of our time. Like who cares? That's easy. And it's special and meaningful to those kids. And that's what matters. And, and if behavior is a concern for you, right. If, if, if struggling with in social situations to help your child with ADHD to, to maintain uh, a, an appropriate behavioral posture with the family, or uh, if you have a child with a diagnosis of autism or ODD, even um, what's easier and more Christmassy than sitting down with the family and and watching a movie or getting in the car and and taking a quick drive around the neighborhood and looking at Christmas lights. Um, when and those are having things that prioritizing discussion with your spouse. That's what matters. Yeah. Right. Is this going to be a good fit for our kids? You know, I want to go see the Nutcracker Ballet. Okay, well, our child who has behavior problems is not going to sit there for two and a half hours in a really boring, the second act is real boring, in a boring show. Like, yeah. we need to talk about that. Why is it a priority? And then can we get creative? But like, if one spouse wants to go see it, go see it without us, you know, take a friend and leave the kids behind and we'll do a kid-tastic thing and um, stuff like yeah. that. Thank and maybe you. we'll maybe we'll watch an, a TV version of the Nutcracker, and we'll only go to the most exciting uh, dance sequences, and we'll just watch those together uh, yeah. because that's what our kids would be interested in. Mm -hmm. uh, you really can. It doesn't have to be the the holiday that you envisioned growing up. It just has to be the holiday that your family uh, is is best off creating for themselves. I think that's that's great advice. Mm -hmm. So. And that can be hard with all that mom guilt or parental guilt and those thoughts that your mind tells you that that's not enough and you have to do all these things. So it's okay. This is a good thing, making it a better fit. You'll enjoy it more. Well, it may not seem like it, but we dads also feel that guilt. Um, <laughs> uh, some more than others, but you know, our goals um, are always going to be making sure that our family has the best possible holiday. And sometimes that means doing less. So that's a great tip to start us off. Um, do you have something else uh, that you like to go to or explain to parents? Um, I think one that we can forget easily as parents trying to make all these things happen is give our kids an out, giving them an appropriate way to escape the situation, get a break from it. We know escape can be a function of problem behavior. And when we think about these holiday events and things, well, they're overstimulating sometimes, you know, if it's a big family gathering, there's a lot of people they are talking at you. It might be loud. It might be hot might be different foods involved. You know, there's lots of environmental variables that are not awesome for your kids. They are not going to feel great in that situation. Their problem behavior could be to get them out of all that stuff they don't like. So ahead of time, what's their out? How can they get a break? How can they say, I'm over it. Like, I can't handle all these, you know, older family members trying to hug me and I don't want to be hugged or whatever it might be. So being proactive ahead of time, what, how can they escape? What's their out? You know, we as adults know how to be like, oh, I need to go to the bathroom when you really don't or step outside to take a phone call when there's no phone call. Like we know how to politely say, oh, excuse me, I need to go do something else when our kids don't know that. And so, so what might some options be like um, making it a, optional for them to sneak off and go sit in the car with the radio on for a little while, um, give them, having an iPad that they can pull out. I know families would be concerned that the kids would want to be on that iPad all day. Um, so there would definitely have to be rules around it, but, you know, maybe finding a bedroom or, or scouting the house out in the beginning mm -hmm. and looking for a place where they could go, um, maybe having some kind of a, even a token system where, you know, if you spend enough time with the family hanging in there and you are earning quietly earning tokens that when you get to enough, we're going to send you off with the iPad to go hang out in this other room, do what you need to recharge your batteries, uh, enjoy some things that may not be socially based um, for a time period and then we'll come back down and we'll do it again and Start over. yeah uh, what do you think about some of those ideas is that kind of along the the lines of what you meant yeah, I think it's perfect just knowing ahead of time we're going to teach this at home ahead of time you know if we try to do it on the fly while we're there 
good luck. You know, <laughs> we'll see what happens. But if we think about it ahead of time and maybe we could go for a walk, we could go get some movement. If we're being still for a really long time, let's just go do jumping jacks outside for a little while and kind of try to regulate ourselves, whatever it may be and teaching it at home ahead of time. Like, Hey, we're going to this event and it's not going to be very fun. Yeah. Or it may not always be very fun. <laughs> or you're just going to, you have to sit quietly for a long time. Um, so how can I make that easier for you? And if your child is non-vocal, well, how do they tell you they need a break normally? Use their AAC device, use gestures, use teaching them, practicing to just tap you on the arm politely, uh, not causing a big scene with problem behavior, whatever their method of communication is, they can do that. And yeah. then get what they need, which is a breather, which is a break from whatever this different holiday stuff is that's that's kind of hard on them sometimes. Yeah. And I think that's probably one of the biggest issues that families face around the holidays is just all the change, mm -hmm. all the transition, all the unexpected transition, which is generally the, the hardest for kids, especially those with a uh, diagnosis of autism or mm -hmm. um or anyone that's that's just really kind of more rigid in their thinking uh, and approach. So uh, great. So far, two really good tips and hints. I'm really excited. Um, I'm, I'm sure the audience. I know the audience is too. Uh, what else do you have for us today? You have a you have a, a third one for us. Yes, <laughs> the most important thing I think is teaching it ahead of time. So how do you do that? How do you teach this out ahead of time? Or how do you teach the expected behaviors ahead of time? And so you know, in the ABA world, we call it behavior skills training. Um, I like to just call it practice because we don't need our jargon all the time, but we need four steps. Our, all of our behavior research tells us um, instructions, modeling, rehearsal, and feedback. So as parents, we're really good at instructions. That's what we do all day long. Do this, do this, do this, do this. And so you might be thinking, oh, I'm being really positive and proactive. Of, we're going to go to this event and here's what it's going to look like. And here's the expectation. And then we stop there. And that is good. That's a good thing. I'm not saying it's not good, but if we take it to the next two steps, that's where the good stuff comes in. That's where our kids actually understand it and can perform in that moment and do these new behaviors. So the second one is modeling. And that means you act it out for them. You are the child and you show them their part. So, Hey, we're going to go to Santa's village this is something my family's doing. We're going to go to Santa's village and it might get really crowded. So I need you to hold my hand or stay within a few feet of me everywhere we go. There we go. That's the expectation. Okay. I'm going to show you now your mom. I'm you let's pretend we're at Santa's village. And so I will walk right next to my child around my house. We'll just act it out and pretend and I'll be silly to get their buy-in to get that pairing and make it reinforcing and fun to practice with mom and be like, Oh, there's Mrs. Claus's house. Oh, I, I got too far from mom. I better get back close again because it's crowded and I need to be safe. And I act it out as the child. That's it. It's not difficult. <laughs> Do you, do you also engage in um, finding some form of reinforcement the, to make that behavior more likely as they practice it? Or do you just do the instruction and practice? Uh, how does the, how does the reinforcement kind of fit into this for you? Yeah, it just depends on the, the kid, right? It's all individualized for a lot of um, the families that I work with just being silly and fun. And it's like playing charades. We make it a game um, is reinforcing. If your child does not want to participate in this with you, if they're like, you're bossing me around and nagging me again, and I'm not having it, then you or can, they're, or it. they're even a little bit older in some ways, yet still, uh, immature in others. And they might think, oh, this is, this is stupid. Why do I have to do this? Or this is embarrassing to have to be next to you. Uh, then maybe you need to find some kind of yeah. additional motivation. Add in that external reinforcement of, well, once we get through the end of this, then you can choose whatever after, whether it's, you know, going to get a treat or video game time or choosing what to listen to in the car ride on the way home, whatever kind of extra reinforcer you can add to the end. Yeah. Yeah. And then the third step with behavior skills training is rehearsal. So you just trade jobs. They need to show you that they learned that skill. So, okay. I was you remember we practice trade jobs. I'm back to being mom. And then you can be silly too. Like, all right, let's go and make all kinds of goofy voices and faces to make it more fun for them to practice. Okay. Show me what that's going to look like. It can take 12 seconds. You can walk four feet and that's it. Or it can take 10 minutes and you can go on this long drawn out thing. There's no rules here. What matters is that we're acting it out together at home. That's all that matters. We told them, we showed them, we had them show us. 
And then the last step is feedback, which is just like, Hey, good job. This is what we're going to do. And then in that moment, we've practiced at home. Now we've gone to this event. You can use this alternate role. You're kind of silly acting out person as the prompt to remind them what to do. So in the moment you have that feedback instead of being like, well, no, that's not how we practiced. You're not doing it correctly. Instead, you just switch back into the, oh, I'm supposed to stay by mom. Oop, here I go and be silly about it in a way that reminds them in a kind and happy way instead of like the normal frustrated nagging parent voice that can fly out of our mouths sometimes. Yeah. And, um, you know, I was just thinking about your when you were discussing the, the practice aspect. Uh, I wonder if uh, for some families it might be the families who struggle a little bit to get their kids engaged, it might be fun to even do like a uh, scavenger hunt around the house or, you know, where you're hiding little toys or trinkets or, or activities or things that the child might want to find, but that if they find it, they only get to, um, they only get to experience it or have it or, or take it if they're within a certain distance of mom when it happens so they can practice getting mom to come with them to the thing they're interested in and going and, and finding the stuff that they want without ever leaving too much for mom. I think that might be a fun way to practice it as well. What do you think? Yeah. Everything to make it more fun, right? Like this is a very important thing that we're practicing behavior skills, but it doesn't have to be boring. It can be a game, make it fun for them. And then they want to do it with you. And then next time in the holiday season, it's like the next day, another thing is happening and okay, we're going to practice what that's going to look like. They're going to be like, oh, heck yes, I want to practice because that was fun and not oh, that again, rolling their eyes because it was lame. Yeah, that's the key. If we can make things fun, our kids will do it. If we wow. expect them to do things against their own desires, then we're going to lose. We're going to we're gonna miss out on opportunities and then we're going to get into the arguing and the, the fighting and the fuss. So yeah, um, yeah. stuff we've got to focus on. When we talk about you have to do these four steps and model it and rehearse it for parents, that sounds really overwhelming. And it sounds like a lot of steps, like I need a, a post-it that tells me what to do next. And the first time that you do it, it it's clunky. It's weird. <laughs> it takes a lot. But after you've done it a couple of times, it becomes so easy where you have a new expectation coming up. Thanksgiving was just last week. Gosh, that feels like a longer time ago here in the US. Mm -hmm. um, and so one thing with my own kids, I was like, okay, you're going to be served food that you don't want to eat. That's going to happen. So instead of making a big deal out of it, just say thank you. And then just leave it on your plate and I'll deal with it for you. You don't have to eat everything on your plate at this meal. That's the expectation. The expectation for us was that you're going to be polite to everybody there and just say, thank you, which was real hard for the kids when they see something that they don't like and they're like, Ugh, you know, um, and so we practiced it at home. I said, that's the expectation. Okay. Pretend you're handing me a plate with something weird on it and you're the parent and I'm the kid. And so they just put their little hands out at me and I went, Oh, huh, thank you. All right. Now you show me here. I am handing you a plate. And they went, thank you. And that was it. It was 30 seconds long, but we did behavior skills training right then to get ready for, you know, whatever meals we went to that had foods that were not their normal foods. Um, I think that the, that all three of these uh, tips have been, have been really helpful, really great. Um, and let's, let's go back over them again, just to make sure that, that everyone remembers what we were talking about. One was um, making sure that we're uh, prioritizing, that we're getting to the family together in advance and prioritizing what it is uh, that really needs to be done this this holiday season and what is the best choice uh, for our family with our different likes and, and dislikes uh, and minimizing, limiting some of the stuff that may be unnecessary and trying to get that out. Um, and then the second tip uh, was, what was the second tip again? Give See, them an I, out. Give the oh, kids yeah. How can they escape? How can they get a break? How can they communicate that to you? Make yeah, sure I need I needed the recap as well because I lost it there for a second. So give the child an opportunity to, to um, a, a way to relieve their own stress or boredom or to overcome this long experience that they may be dealing with that isn't necessarily in their best interest or uh, something that they would choose for themselves, but that they're doing for you and for your traditions. Uh, give them something, a, a way out and an opportunity for them to do things. That's and even if it's something they love, like they wanted to go ice skating or they wanted to go look at Christmas lights, it can still be overstimulating to them for some reason. So 
even when you're like, well, they shouldn't need an out for this. That was the thing they put on the list. They still might. There's just so many extra emotions and stimuli and things coming at us during the holidays. So no matter what, make sure they know how to get what they need, which in that moment might be a, a break. Yeah, that's, yeah, that's so true. Um, knowing, knowing your child's abilities and levels of, of handling these sort of things is going to be a, a big help as well. And I think when you're attuned to these sort of things, and I, like I said, when, with your idea of, of parenting with science, this understanding the principles and understanding how they affect our behavior really gets parents thinking in the right way, it gets them understanding what challenges their kids may be facing rather than how do I just get my kids to do what I want them to do? And I think that's, uh, that's really helpful. So, yeah. um, and then the third we said was practice behavior skills training, but I just call it practice at home, act it out. Don't yeah. stop at just telling them what to do. We're real good at that as parents. Don't stop there, show them and then have them show you. Yeah. The four steps to behavior skills training, give your instruction, uh, model it, uh, have them practice it and then feedback, make sure that they understand exactly uh, whether or not what they're doing is what you're looking for. And, and I would also make sure that, that, you know, if you're going into a new situation, a tough situation that they have something that they could be working towards or earning as well. Um, so if you, if they know up front uh, that there's, there's an opportunity for them to have access to a special thing on the ride home or, you know, stuff that would be a little bit dependent on behavior, it's going to give them that little extra push to, to really try to focus on those things at the tougher times. Yeah. Oh, that's awesome. So thank you so much. No, thank uh, you. Really great help. Um, and I really appreciate you joining us. Um, before we go, before we say goodbye, though, I'd like, can you, do you mind standing up and uh, showing us your, your t-shirt? my sweatshirt? Your... I'm just going to pull this down. Oh, that's where it's, yeah. Tell me what you want, what you really, really want. Oh, wait, it clicked away from you. Can you speak again? Uh, yeah, it says, tell me what you want, what you really, really want. That's my cute. Spice Girls and Santa combo. <laughs> <laughs> That's so cute. Uh, thank, thank you so you. much for helping us uh, all get into the holiday spirit. Oh, man, we love the holiday spirit around here, so I'm all in. <laughs> yeah, that's cool. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, BCBA and now friend of the show, Leanne Page. Uh, be sure to check out her work at parentingwithaba.org. And don't forget to look up her two books, Enjoy Parenting and Parenting with Science. Uh, both are best-selling quick and easy reads for moms. Uh, I truly hope that y'all have a great holiday season, whatever your faiths or your traditions. Uh, we here at Just 7 Steps want yours to be fantastic this year and every year. If you're struggling to gain the family life that you're hoping for, or you just want a way to organize so that you're maximizing your parenting time with your kids, Check us out at just7steps.com where you can enjoy our free workshop, how to get your kids to listen without raising your voice or nagging. Uh, wouldn't that be a great thing to have happen throughout the holidays? All right. Thanks again, Leanne. I really appreciate you being here with us. Uh, you have yourself a wonderful holiday season to the best to you and your family. Thank you. Happy holidays. All right. Well, take care and thanks again. Happy holidays, everyone. Bye.